I want to share with you two case studies very briefly. One is from Northern Ethiopia, the other one is from Russia, um, just to illustrate uh, where this intersection, this nexus between um, climate change, biodiversity loss, food, water, resource security is happening. So you might know, and um, I think Philly said uh, that you covered Northern Ethiopia before, so you will know about the long history of the politics of famine, as one scholar called it uh, back in the early 1990s, the politics of famine at the Horn of Africa. So historically, there's a track record of at least seven major droughts per century, but this uh, figure is increasing due to deforestation, due to soil erosion, and of course, to changing weather patterns. Um, in 1974, the then uh, regime in Ethiopia was actually brought down partly through the impacts of drought and famine. I mean, people were angry. This triggered a lot of political conflict. Now, politics of famine is also connected to hunger as a weapon. People can't grow any food. People can't buy any food. Food aid is looted, especially by soldiers. Aid workers are prevented from uh, reaching the hardest hit areas. And the obvious thing is happening. You might think that people who are hungry won't take up a weapon, but if they, if they can get one, of course they will take it and use it because they are angry. They don't have anything to lose, it makes them prone to crime and violence, it makes them susceptible to radicalization, to the recruitment um, by uh, radical groups. And, uh, and militias. This is a problem for Ethiopia, but it's also becoming a problem for the entire region because Ethiopia is now becoming or is already a source of instability in the entire region, which is already highly volatile. So this is just to illustrate to you that climate and conflict are deeply interlinked. The second case study for you, and this one is on Russia more concretely on the gas pipeline Nord Stream 2. You will have followed this in the news. The West has tensions uh, with Russia over its role in Ukraine, uh, the treatment of opponents of the Putin regime like Alexei Navalny, the overall, um, the overall disregard for human rights, and you might know a few more examples. But at the same time, something very different is happening. At the same time, Russia is building the biggest fossil fuel mega project in Europe, the Nord Stream 2 guy pipeline. Uh, the US government and, you know, be it Trump, be it Biden, has for the past, whenever this project was first launched, eight years or so, been severely opposed to the project and wanted Germany in particular to get out of it. Largely because and this you can see here, because the new pipeline will actually circumvent existing pipelines that go, as you can see here, through Belarus, uh, but also through Ukraine. So how are Ukraine and Belarus's uh, gas supplies uh, going to be secured? Of course, we all wish for them uh, to base their energy system on renewables as soon as possible, but it's not going to happen for the foreseeable future. They depend on Russian gas. But if there's a new pipeline where it's uh, much easier, much cheaper to, uh, to transport um, gas, that's a problem for them. In particular, if Russia thinks that for some reason it should um, punish Belarus or um, well, Ukraine in particular, um, and decides not to um, export any gas anymore to them. So to essentially um, disable the existing pipeline, which you see here in blue. That was um, the US government's main concern for the past few years. But uh, the US, um, uh, but the pipeline, is also posing completely a different issue. The pipeline is supposed to export fossil gas to Germany until way beyond 2050. And let's not forget by 2050, uh, the G7 have um, just um, committed again that they want to be completely out of fossil fuels, that they want to be zero carbon economies. And that doesn't quite make sense. This new pipeline will produce 100 million additional tons of CO2 per year plus emissions from methane leakages. Um, methane is 25% more polluting 
uh, so it's 25%, uh, 20, 25 times uh, more of an impact on the climate uh, than CO2. And it's leaking from different, uh, different parts of um, gas infrastructure. So huge uh, problem when it comes to curbing climate change. And that's uh, especially against the background of Germany in particular doesn't even require gas imports uh, from Russia, at least not um, if it's taking its own climate targets and its energy transition targets seriously. So we can um, use our renewable energy, we can become more ambitious when, ambitious when it comes to energy efficiency, and we can also re use our reliable existing supplies from, in this case, other parts of Russia, but also from Norway. So what I wanted to illustrate to you very briefly with this slide is that climate, the climate agenda and geopolitics are deeply interlinked. You've got everything. Um, you've got um, the villain in Moscow, you've got human rights abuses, you've got a non-democratic um, country that's posing a threat uh, to the Western world, although it's probably not as dangerous um, as it used to be, with climate change um, come in, and you've got, of course, enormous economic interests, both by Russia and uh, by German companies.